All right, ladies and gentlemen, last week we started off talking about the mitzvah. One of the commandments, of course, is on Purim to read the Megillah, to read the story of the Megillah. We went through a number of different scenarios. Oh, no, I'm not going to test you, but we're going to go. Uh, come on, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. We went through a number of different scenarios on which day the, the uh, Purim falls out. Various towns, villages, and cities read it at different towns. The Mishnah start off with a mysterious statement by saying the Megillah is read on the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. And then we decided, what do you mean? How could it be read on all of those different days? Went through a number of scenarios. Now tell me, when could it be read on the 11th? There's one time that it can be read on the 11th. When it comes out on a Sunday. So if it comes out on a Sunday, yes. If it's, if it's on a Sunday, yes, then the Megillah is read on Thursday. It goes back to previous Thursday only for small villages. But for big cities, are going to read it when? Sunday. No. Sunday. 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 They're going to read it on Sunday. And the walled cities? Walled cities will read it on? Monday. Monday. Okay, so let's go again. If it falls out on Monday, Purim falls out on Monday. Okay, what happens? Everybody. So everybody reads it on a Monday except for? Small villages. Except for small, vi no, small villages read it on a Monday, except for walled cities. Walled cities then read it on a? Mm. Read the, right, okay. Wait, wait, why don't the small villages read the day before? Because Monday and Thursday they read it. Oh, it's market okay. days, okay? It's always market days, okay? So they're anyways coming into the big city, so they read it. So if it's okay, so if it's Monday, villages, cities read it on Monday. Walled cities read it on Tuesday. If it's Tuesday, they read it on Monday, and then the rest of no, they read it on Monday and the the, the one Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, we, it's, okay. If it comes out on Shabbos, since the Megillah is never read on Shabbos, so when do we go? Back to Thursday? One second. Shabbos is going to be a question over here, okay? So, let's see. Cholis be Shabbos. So, Kfarim Vayar is Gedoyle. So, cities and villages and big cities read it on Thursday, because you won't go back to Friday. Read it back on Thursday. And then the other ones, the walled cities, read it on Sunday. So, read it on Sunday, because Sunday is Sunday is a thing, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, now, okay, now, you know what, who cares, no, no, the th th <laughs> truth of the matter is like this, last week, Dr. Kern asked a question, and she kind of, I gave her the answer, but she didn't believe me, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to, I just wanted to start off with this, the question was in Yerushalayim, did you ask the question, of, and, and, no, no, I didn't, oh, you didn't ask, I didn't Oh, you didn't check? Okay, so I'm going to show. So I'm going to. So here we're, here we're going to have. The question was last week was what about the walled cities today? What do walled cities do? Because we have in the Mishnah it tells us that the walled cities read it the next day. What about the walled cities today? So we went through a number of different cities: Jericho, Akko, uh, Lisbon. What? No, you know, gated communities. I mean, all different. No, this is actually a wall. Uh, prisons. You know. Uh, many, many different things. So here is, here is a Shulchan Aruch. This is the Code of Jewish Law. And I, I, and I had it over here. I, I looked it up this week. Let's, I'm going to make sure that... Okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. Where's Walled Cities? Oh, 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 oh. Here, 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 here we go. Here we go. Page Shin. That's page 300. So on page 300... I'm going to quote from the Code of Jewish Law, which tells us very interestingly, like this. Okay? Here we go. Cities that, have, cities that we don't know. Questionable cities, if they were walled from the times of Joshua. Right? We don't know. So he says like this. There was an old, old custom in Tiberia, that's Tiberius, to read it on the 14th with a blessing and on the 15th with no blessing. Why was that? Because we didn't know whether this wa this, the wall was from before Joshua or if it was built after Joshua. Now, the custom is in most cities to read it only on the 14th. But if you happen to be very strict and happen to be in Tiberia, you read it on the 14th and the 15th. Some claim that the city of Tzvat, Hebron, 
Haifa, Shechem, Akko, and Lud, these six cities. So we had Svat, Hebron, Haifa, Shechem, Akko, and Lud. These are all biblical cities. It, it's questionable. We don't know whether they were walled before Joshua or after Joshua. That's why many people read it on the 14th with a blessing, but on the 15th with no blessing. And this is also true for Jericho and Beit Shan. But, he writes, right now, the custom is that the only place you read it on the 15th is Yerushalayim. It's the only city. And the small little sections around it. What about a city in Chutz Loritz? That means a city that's, that's outside in the, in the diaspora. Then there's no question. There's no question about it. Ainley's topic, Ben. There's no question whether it's the 14th or the 15th, either with a blessing or no blessing. It doesn't make a difference. If it was a walled city, from, even from the time of Yeshua ben Nun, you always read it on the 14th. That's it. So even if you had a city, let's say a really old city, what can be an oldest city that we know? Somewhere in Babylon, let's say. You know, ur Custom. You found a city in ur Custom in the days of Abraham or whatever it was. You know, or Haran. It doesn't make a difference. You read it only on the 14th. So it's which, the only one city, read it on the 15th, and that's the eternal capital of Israel forever and ever and ever. Okay. What about, this is even more, I'll give you a chance to, to, to answer a question, because this is even more interesting. In the city of Shushan, Right? Which, what happened in Shushan? Oh, thank you very much. That was a city that they lived in. Even though that they established, Mordechai Nestor established that the Purim should be on the 15th, we don't know. Therefore, your own, exactly where Shushan is, we don't know. Even though there's a city that I saw today called Hash, Hash Medad or something like that. Hashmedad, which is an Iranian city which supposedly Esther and Mordechai are buried in that city. Therefore, you only read it on the 14th. So if you happen to be in a place called Shushan in Iran, and even though you think that this is the city that Esther was there, you still only read it on the 14th. What was the name of the city that we think they were buried in? Hashmedad or something? Some Iranian city, I think it's... Later on? Not Shushan, no. no, no, it wasn't that. Okay, so that kind of answers the question. So when we're talking about here, about the, the 15th, we're really only talking about one city, and that's Yerushalayim, Irakaydish, just so to get that right. You are, so I did not call you to check Right. But my question is this. When I was growing up in Israel, yes. and it was the day of Purim, yes. the yes. the whole Yes. The religious people in Yerushalayim did it the next day, but not everybody. Okay, that could be true, but uh, that, that could be true. That I, do, that I don't know. That, that I don't know, but he, clearly the Megillah is read in Yerushalayim on the 15th. Now, that, that, that must be, it, you know, it must be. So if you go to B'nai Brak and you want to listen to the Megillah this year, you're not going to hear it on Tuesday. You're going to hear it on Wednesday. You're going to hear it on Wednesday in Yerushalayim. Okay? So only in Yerushalayim. That's it. That's the only city. So if I ask my father, he would say, huh? It's possible. It's possible. You know, you know see, people take for granted that Israelis are Talmud de Chachamim. They're not. They just happen to be born in Israel. That's a, yeah. Right. 14th. Everybody's the 14th. The, the, the Talmud gives the question. Yeah. yeah. Scenarios about when to read on the, the various world. days. Correct. And then the Shulchan Aruch turns around and says, "Well, say Jericho, for instance. Even right. though it says in the Talmud, don't do it. I mean, what right. does it rationalize the, the decision? Okay. The Shulchan Aruch came after a long process of debate, of of you know, of going through fine tuning the the Talmud. The Talmud generally left many questions open ended many questions open-ended. So since it's a question of Jericho, which kind of was the wall there, was the wall not there, back and forth, and then in Tiberia, exactly all of these cities, when the wall was built. So, so therefore, since we're not certain, that, and no one could give us clear guidance when exactly the wall was built, we'll take it for granted that they, we count them in as the general body. Now, as he says over here, there's a caveat that if you want to be extra careful and you want to say, hey, you know what, I'm in Jericho, and I think that Jericho might have a walled city by the, from Yeshua bin Nun, then I'll read it twice. 
I'll read it once to be part of the, the general Jewish population, and second, I'll be part, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cover all of the bases. But that's really what the Shulchan Aruch did. And this, this, the one I'm reading from right now is really a, a, a modern one. It was, I mean, it's just, just been written by a rabbi that's still around. They, they took all of the different opinions in the Gemara, all of the different scenarios in the Gemara, and, now, and then they tried to fine-tune it to make it work. Because as you know, in the Gemara, it's very, we're, we're, we're going to go through a litany of, of different scenarios now. We only had the Mishnah. The Mishnah was already mysterious in and of itself. And we're going to soon see down here something, uh, I mean, I, 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 I would mention it later on, that they even later on abolished all of what the Mishnah said. The rabbis in the time of the Talmud said, no, we're not reading, not, not Yud Aleph, not Yud Beis, not Yud Gimel, only Yud Dal. It doesn't make a difference. Even though the Mishnah said that small towns may be uh, able to read it on the 11th, 12th, and 13th, but we are abolishing that. So, and then, it come, then, then we'll find out why. So that's, that's, basically the, that's basically the process. But it took a number of, number of years to, you know, to do this. Okay. The Mishnah, before we get into this question that Mark asked, let's go back previously. The Mishnah stated clearly that the Megillah was allowed to be read on a number of different occasions, on a number of different days. So if it came out on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, according to which cities, that's the way, that's, that's how the Megillah was read. How do, where, where did they take the authority to do this? In the Megillah itself, I mean, let's just pull up here just for a second, because it's going to be important for us to understand that where, where the authority comes from. Okay? In the Megillah, it clearly says that she, write, she says, I mean, she was very uh, insistent on writing this. So she says, Kimu v'kiblo yehudim and... Bisman Nehem. Where where's that? So he says over here. Uh, this is chapter number nine, I believe, in the Megillah, verse number twenty-seven. The Jews confirmed and undertook upon themselves and their posterity, and upon all those who might join them to observe these two days. Which two days? The fourteenth and the fifteenth. Very good. Without fail in the manner prescribed and at the proper time each year. So the celebration takes place when? Clearly from the Megillah, on which two days? The 14th and the 15th. So where did they come up with 11th? So where did the rabbis come up with the 11th? So that's how the, that's how the Gemara is going to start off asking the first question. So let's get, let's, get to the, let's get to the Gemara, okay? You see the big Gimel Mem, or where it says the word Gemara on page 2A? It says like this. Megillah Nikras Pir Aleph. The Megillah is read on the eleventh day of, of, of Adar. The Gemara asks, Min Olon. How do they know this? I mean, under what authority does the Mishnah have? I don't care how great the Mishnah is, but if it says in the Megillah, we just read it these two days. So why don't they have now five days? Where does it go five days? So he says, Min Olon. So this is how Ben generally had the Gemara is written. You ask a question, how do we know? You should have stated, as it says further on, on, and a couple of pages down, it says that they, they, made, they, made, a, they made a gzera, they made, they, made a, they made a ruling. They said like this, The rabbis, the sages, made a leniency, a concession to the villages. That they may push it off to the next uh, market day or court day. But remember, when we say pushing it off, meant we go retro, right? Not forward, we go backwards. So if it's Tuesday, we go Monday. If it's Wednesday, we go Monday. If it's Friday, we go Thursday. If it's Shabbos, we go Thursday, okay? Sunday, we go th always going backwards, okay? They what? They early did it. All right. They pushed it backwards to the, to the court day. Why? Now, here's the, here's the rationale behind it. Today, in order, that they may um, provide or supply water and food to their brethren him in the big cities. Okay? So if Tuesday and Wednesday, if, if so, if so, if Tuesday or Wednesday Purim comes out, 
and they have already read the Megillah back in the days because they came on Monday. So what do they do on Purim itself? They're not busy with the Megillah. Everybody else is busy with the Megillah. So since they're not busy with the Megillah, they can have now the opportunity of supplying the food and the water to their brethren in the big city. So they made it easier for them. They gave them this concession. Since they anyways have to come into the court dates, so now on a Tuesday, a, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, they're free, and the people in the big villages, in the big cities are busy, so they'll supply it. So now, without any ration, without any telling us how, what, when, where, because we still have the question. We didn't really answer the question, right? We, our, our initial question was what? How could the rabbis have done this? So we answered the rabbis did it. That, that's, that, that's an answer. That, that's an answer. But it separates, doesn't it? This law separates those, it, it almost makes a society of has and have nots. Two classes. Two classes of people, those that celebrate on a certain days and those that Yeah, that that's day. fine. That, 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 that's true. That's, that, that's, we're okay with that. My only question is, we go back to the original question of how did we, how were they able to do that? So where's the scriptural authority? Yes. Yeah. Where's the scriptural authority? It's great. It's fine. It's wonderful. Okay, you know what? It gives everybody a break so they're not busy on Tuesday. They can supply the food. They make a few extra bucks or whatever it is. Great. Wonderful. I understand the rationale, but hey, you know what? Why don't you have them, why don't you have them read the McGill three months before? So then, 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 then they'll, really be, they'll really be free well, for Purim. We have lots of holidays. Why don't we make a concession? We have lots of holidays. Why don't we make a concession? Yeah, the only yeah. thing is, uh, I'll tell you what, the, the, that, that, that is a little bit different because Pesach, Sukkot, and Shvuris, Shvuris are already by, by, by nature Torah holidays. So to touch them is much, much harder. Don't forget this whole enterprise we're talking about here is post-biblical. Oh, right? Yeah, Hanukkah. So that's why they made them. So for Hanukkah, they made concessions. Believe me. They make concessions what kind of oil you can use, where you can light it, how you can light it, what time you can light it. Not Shabbos candles. Shabbos candles have to be lit 423. You're lighting at 423. Hanukkah candles, you know, you could light them 12 o'clock at night. You could light them here. You could light them there. So they were able to, they're able to massage it. Who says, I mean, if it's a real holiday, you shouldn't be able to go to work. You know, it should be exactly the same. So here they were able, you're still able, because it's a rabbinical holiday, there's still leeway involved. But still, even, even if, when there's leeway, when we read a verse, I read for you verse number 27 that says these two days. So where did they get from these two days? They write, now I understand it logically. Okay? They gave us a rational reason for this. Fine. But still, we need to know where their basis was. They, they, can't, they just can't come up all of a sudden and wake up one day and say, like Kenny said, you know what? All of a sudden, okay, this, this row here will be able to read on the 11th, and this row here is going to read it on the 14th, because this is Galicianer and these are Polisher. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Okay? So now we have to go back. To, so he says, Anon, so now the Gemara is going to ask, now that we know what it is, Anan The question is, what do we mean? What did we mean by, by this question when we said how do they know that? Mechte, let us see Kula, all of this, all of these rules and regulations, the 11th, 12th, and 13th, Anche Knesses Hagdoilet Takninuhu. Who who established it? The men of the Great Assembly. Okay? Now who were the men of the Great Assembly? So this this what happened was that following the story of Purim, okay, Esther was married to Achashverosh. Esther had a son with Achashverosh. At least one we know of. His name was Darius. Okay? Darius became the king after his father Achashverosh died. Now Darius by law was a he was a Jew. Okay, now he knew that he was Jewish, but I don't think he ever practiced anything, which is, which is a question of itself, okay? But nonetheless, here was Darius, and he was a king, and he allowed the Jews to go and rebuild the second temple, okay? Not only did he allow the Jews to go and rebuild the second temple, but when the Jews went to Jerusalem, and they started to rebuild, they were harassed by the indigenous people, because, you know, people already had moved in there. 
I mean, you think if you leave for 70 years and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's, it's hollow, people start moving into Yerushalayim. So the people that lived already now in Yerushalayim, the newcomers, the new immigrants, didn't want the Jews to build the base of Migdash because that just meant reestablishing the Jewish, uh, you know, the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish state, okay? So what they did is they ran back to Darius and they said to Darius, hey, you know, we got a problem here. We have a problem. We don't have. We don't. We, people are harassing us. So he sent a contingent of Persian soldiers to protect them while they built the base of Migdash. They rebuilt it and they established a Sanhedrin. This Sanhedrin was unlike another Sanhedrin, which is normally how many rabbis? Seven. Seventy-one. Seventy-one. This was the Anshik Nesagdola, were comprised of hundred and twenty sages. And the 120 sages established much of what we have today in Judaism. Like, for example, one of their key elements that they established was the Shmon Esri, the 18 benedictions, the prayers. Because until then, it was all hot. You know, you prayed whatever you needed. You prayed. I mean, if you were a, a farmer, you prayed for rain. If you were a, 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 a software engineer, you prayed for everything to crash, so you, you know you're gonna, so you could give so the tech support and whatever you needed, you you know you prayed for, right? The, they established the 18 benedictions because now don't forget that when the Jews came back for this for the second Commonwealth, it wasn't the same level of Jews anymore. I mean, they were less knowledgeable. It was a poor community. Who came back? Let's be honest. Who left Babylon to come to to come to Israel? Not. Ezra begged, and nobody showed up with him. I mean, there's several thousand people went with him, right? The, a lot of people stayed in Babylon. Why? Because now one guy owned the Babylonian uh, shirt concessions. The other guy had a Babylonian sock concessions. That's, they, that's exactly it. History always repeats itself. It's, you know, people lived in nice houses. They spoke the language. They already, you know, 70 years, you know, it's, it's, already a, it's two generations. In two generations, the kids speak Persian, right? How many kids here speak Yiddish today in America? Think about three generations. The grandparents spoke Yiddish. The kids kind of understood a few dirty words in Yiddish, you know, when the parents screamed at them. And the grandkids say, what's Yiddish, right? That's basically, right? They speak English today. Everybody speaks English. So, so think about that, right? Think about that. Why was it any different in those days? The first generation spoke Hebrew. The second generation spoke a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic. And by the th time the third generation came around, it was all Aramaic. They already spoke Aramaic. Goodbye. And they, th they, they, they kind of davened in Hebrew, but it's like us trying to break our teeth in the transliteration, like, you know, in Shul over there, you know, Lechon or whatever it was over there. So the Antje Knesset Agdola tried to reestablish within Israel a, form, a format that's going to fit now the new type of Jew that came back from Babylon that needed much more direction, they needed much more a kind of a structure within Judaism rather than this freewheel, freewheeling thing that they had in the first temple. So this Anshe Knesset Zagdoyle, he says, they were the ones, they, who still remembered Esther and still remembered Mordechai, they were the ones that established all of these rules, the, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th, and the 15th. We still haven't come to the scriptural. Where, where do they have the scriptural authority from? But we're going back now historically to give us strength, because don't forget, in halacha, in Jewish law, the further you go back, the stronger your argument becomes. So if you could bring Moses as, your, as testimony, you're in. The further you get away from Moses, the shakier, you, uh, shakier ground you become. All right? So just remember that. The further back in history is good. Much better. Did they have the Megillah, Rabbi? Oh, yeah. Sure they had the Megillah. They wrote it that year. Oh. That year they wrote the Megillah. And, in that, and instead of next year, they already started to establish the holiday of Purim. She made sure on those two days they, they would do that. So the Gemara says like this, okay? So he says... Well, I just lost my... The men of the great assembly established this. Because if you think, if you ponder that the men of the great assembly, they only established the 14th and the 15th, 
then came along the sages in subsequent generations, and they uprooted it, meaning what they said was, hey, look at this. The men of the great assembly said 14th and 15th, but we're going to say 11th, 12th, and 13th the same way. We're going to extend it. How, do you, how could you do that? Because there's a general rule, and look at this one. Takanta, right? A regulation. The takinu anshik nesesak doila that the men of the great assembly established. Vatnan, we learned, and they went ahead, the rabbis went ahead, and even though the men of the great assembly had established this regulation, they uprooted it. How could they have done that? But now we learned, Ein Bezdin, no court. Yochel is permitted or is able, Levatel, to abolish Divrei Bezdin, Chaveroi, the uh, ordinances of another Bezdin, Ella Im Kain, except or unless Godel Mimenu, it is greater from it, Bechachma, in wisdom, Ubeminion, and in numbers. Okay? So and as regular 71 is greater in numbers, it was not. And greater in wisdom, this is the key that the further you go back in history, the greater wisdom we have. Okay? So a Bezdin of the year 70 could not abolish something, an ordinance of what a Bezdin of the year in 300 BC did. Because they're not greater in numbers, nor are they greater in wisdom. So here, so how does this reflect upon our present situation? So if the Anshik Knesset Sagdola, if the men of the Great Assembly established it and said only 14th and 15th, can subsequent Bezdins go ahead and extend it to 11, 12, and 13? No. No, except only in the case of where they're greater in number and greater in wisdom. Now you have to prove that you're greater than Ezra and Nehemiah and all of this. These, are, these were prophets. These were not only were they great men of great wisdom, but they actually were divinely inspired. So if I come along today and I say, listen, Ezra was a nice guy. And he's a wonderful guy, but we in America, we know so much more because we have the internet and we have access to, 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 to space travel. That's say, yeah, yeah. And the moment that you can turn water into wine is the day that you can overturn. And so then we go up to Napa Valley. Who knows? Okay, let's go. That'll be for, that for, yeah, that's for a different day. But then, so, so therefore, you have to say, we're forced to say that these dates, the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, were established by whom? The men of the Great Assembly. They were the ones that when they first came to Israel, they said, this is what we're going to do, that people in small villages can read it then, people in big cities read it then, and people in wall cities read it a third day. Okay? But we still haven't answered the original question. You know what? It's like it's like it's the it's like spinning. This is like this is like spinning. You know what? We ask you a question, say, well, it was the men of the great assembly. But still, if Esther said, right, and she established it, let's read again the verse, because it's a very important verse. And the Jews confirmed and undertook upon themselves and their posterity, and upon all those who might join them, to observe these two days without fail in the manner prescribed and at the proper time each year. Consequently, these days should be remembered and celebrated by every single generation, family, province, and city. And these days, they keep referring to these days of Purim, should never cease among the Jews, which tells us that even when Mashiach comes, when Mashiach comes, there's a debate whether the mitzvahs will be actually, will, be, will, will, will have any kind of consequence. Because when Mashiach comes, the world will be perfect. Purim will still be around. Because, right, Purim will never cease among the Jews, nor their remembrance perish from their descendants. Okay? Okay? So you have, we still have the question that we kept talking about these days, these days, these days, these days. How did they have a right? Where, where, what gave them a right to extend it to the 11th, 12th, and 13th? Okay? Even a body as great as the men of the Great Assembly. And they were attack a great body. They were special people. You know, they remembered. Some of them uh, you know, came back. Well, they might have been older, but they, they could have even remembered the, the end of the First Temple era because it was only a 70-year period. So let's say a guy was five years old 
And then he was 70 years, so he's 75. He had 80 year old men or 85 year old men that came back and remembered the first temple. Like, think about that. People that still remember the first temple came back, lived through the entire exile. So they had tremendous weight on their side, especially now you have prophets, the last of the prophets. Yeah, Mika and all these, the last, the very, very last of all of the prophets. Because once the men of the great assembly died, prophecy ended. That was it. No more prophecy. That's why we had a very big problem later on when, you know, we start talking about people who started talking in the name of God. You know what I'm talking about, especially around the time of the, the time of, the time of, uh, you know what that time was. Hillel, you know, Hillel and this, where prophecy had already, already long ended. There was no prophets anymore in Israel. But then all of a sudden we had, the, you know, we had, okay, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I've got, uh, right, uh, let's go further. So he says like this. So he says, but it's simple, it's obvious, that all of this, all of these dates, these five dates, were all established initially by the Anshik Knesset Agadayla. Then we're going to ask a question, how so? We're still going, we, we talked about for half an hour in circle. Great, okay, the Anshik Knesset Agadayla established it. I don't care if it was Moshe Rabbeinu, but how? How did they have the right? Where did they learn? So the Gemara says, Hey Charamiza, where did they get, where did they have the, where, where, where was it hinted in the scripture, as we have here, where is it hinted in the scripture that these days are allowed? Amr Reb Shimon Bar Abba, so Reb Shimon Bar Abba, Amr Reb Yochanan said in the name of Reb Yochanan, Amr Kra, it says in the verse, Lekayim, to establish, Lekayim, this is, this is in, in chapter number 9, let's find Lekayim Aleim, no not Lekayim Aleim, but we had the verse. Where was the verse? Where is that? No, in number nine. Lekayim imperial el was manayim. Or lekayim. Where did I have that? Kim of a kibul yudin manayim bazam 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 but I'm trying to find which verses it, it is here. Lekayim. Okay, let me remember. Ah, here it is. Okay. Here it is. Lekayim Aleihem. It says, and um, tr- chapter number, verse number 20, Mordechai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Achishverosh, near and far, charging them that they should observe annually the 14th and the 15th day of Adar as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, Kayomim, right, from the, from, from, from the enemies, and the month which had been transformed to them from one of sorrow to gladness and from mourning to festivity. They observed them as days of feasting and of gladness and for sending delicacies to one another and gifts to the poor. The Jews undertook to continue the practice they had begun just as Mordechai had prescribed for them. So he, he says over here, what does it say? Lekayim, no, that's not the verse. Okay? I thought that was the verse, but that's not the verse. That's not verse number. I'm going to find it in one second. In the Kayim, there's. Oh, here it is. Okay, you were hiding here in verse number 31. To establish these days of Purim on the proper dates, just as Mordechai. The Jew, uh, Mordechai the Jew, and Queen Esther had enjoined them and they had undertook upon themselves and their posterity the matter of the fast and their lamentations. So it says, dispatches were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Cheshverish with words of peace and truth, now listen closely, to establish these days of Purim on their proper dates. Okay. Now listen to this. This is how this is how they get this, how they were able to establish it. So they read the verse, they said to themselves like this: to establish these days of Purim on their proper dates. Now, what does that mean? Why do you need that? Why do you need that extra verbiage on their proper dates? What is that what does that mean to tell us? If it would have just said to establish these days of Purim, just as Mordechai the Jew had enjoined them, wouldn't that have been enough? What do you need on their proper dates? Maybe it's like the oh. Chodesh. 
Oh, yeah, that's what that, that's, that's exactly how they learned it. So he says like this, but when the word bisman nehem, on their dates, right? He says, Lamed Aleph, he bisman nehem. So the rabbis learned, why is that their extra, there's a word, what is this extra clause? What does this clause tell us? On their proper dates to establish it on the 11th, 12th, and 13th. Because it already had said, look at the first part of the verse, to establish these days, so these days tell us which days? 14th and 15th. Ah, now we're coming. Okay, this is good, this is good. To establish these days of Purim, so we have on the 14th and the 15th, on their proper dates. Now what does the proper dates tell us? There must be other proper dates besides these dates that we mentioned in the first part of the sentence. Right? These days and proper dates are two separate dates. That's how they learned it. So let's go look into the Gemara. Let's go back to the Gemara here for a second. So he said to this, Omer Kra, it says in the verse, Lekayim, that they accepted upon themselves, as Yimeya Purim, these days of Purim, Bismanim on their proper dates. Ah. Bismanim on their proper dates is plural. Doesn't say Bisman on their date, but on their proper dates. So the Gemara says, Zmanim harbe tiknu lahem. They established it on many, many dates. On many dates. Since there's a verse, Bismanihem, you see how they you see how you see what kind of hint they took? They took the word Bismanihem on their proper dates to tell us it's more than one date. Now 14th and 15th are one unit. Since it didn't say on their date, so it says on their proper dates. On their proper dates must mean that there's a multiple number of dates, so we'll include the 11th and the 12th as well. Oh, the 11th and the 12th as well. Okay. So he says, the Gemara asks a good question. What are you talking about? How can the rabbis have used that word on their proper dates to establish the 11th and the 12th? Okay, you have to, you have to, this is where you have to keep, you have to keep your Talmudic mind straight. Don't fall asleep at this part because this is, this is the most exciting part of the entire Talmud here. Of the 2,500 pages, this is number, this is the most riveting page of all. The rabbis ask a good question, the Talmud asks a good question. What are you talking about? You know what proper dates means? Plural. Come on. The 14th and the 15th. That's a touch. That's why they're talking about plural. You want to know Bisman Nahem in their proper dates is referring to the 14th and the 15th. We needed to tell us that they had to do it on their proper dates. Not like you want to tell us that they, they, they extended it to the 11th and the 12th. Haimi Boile Ligufe. They needed it for their own self, meaning for the days of the 14th and the 15th to make sure that they don't mess up or do it, who knows, 16th and 17th or whatever, later on. So you can't tell me that this word in their proper dates, or in Hebrew, we'll keep referring to the Bisman Nehem, tells us that there's a multiple number of dates. Now, Bisman Nehem comes to warn us and to tell us that the 14th and the 15th have to be kept in their proper dates. So the Gemara goes, what are you talking about? Okay, this is they, they, it's like schizophrenic. The Gemara likes talks. It's you know it's bipolar. Has like two kind of two kind of uh, char characters. In Cain, if you say that the only reason why they put this word in their proper dates was to protect the 14th and the 15th, Zman. They should have said in its proper time. My Zman Nehem. Why does it say it plural in their times, right with an S? That S is a, is, 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 is a big letter because 14th and 15th is one unit. It could have just said in the proper time and it would have read like this. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the drawing board here. To establish these days of Purim on their proper date or time. Right? Then why does it have to say on their dates or times? Plural. It should have could said on their proper date. Okay? Zmanim toiva. Because it wants to tell us that there's a number of different days. That's why it uses the words ma ne em. Now you have to understand that this is like taking each word in the Megillah. Now you see, this is already when Jews didn't have a country to run. This is just this is just this is just a side side bar. Okay? This could only work, this kind of study can only work when your greatest geniuses have full time leisure or could become rabbis and students and scholars. 
But if they were like, you know, municipal uh, workers, if they were busy building bridges, you wouldn't have this kind of study because you know how, you know how long it takes to go through a Megillah with each word analyzed, like this word, Zmanayim? You know, it's already half a page. We're still dealing on one word. That's why you have 2,500 pages of Talmud because every word in the Torah is analyzed, scrutinized, cut up, dissected, okay? That's what the Gemara is trying to say. See, because when Mordechai sat there, what basically they're trying to figure out is when Mordechai sat there and wrote it, and he, he expressed it to some, you know, and expressed it, he, he did it Baruch HaKadosh. He did it with divine inspiration. So now we have a right to sit down and try to figure out what was his initial intent. If his initial intent was only to protect the 14th and the 15th, he would have saved himself a lot of ink by writing Zman. Right? He could have put... In its proper time, not in Bizman Nehem. You know how many extra letters that is to write? And with ink, you know what the ink cost back then in Persia with a quill? <laughs> Don't you think of it? So therefore, he says, but still, but the Gemara still doesn't want to let go. But still, you might want to say, no, 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 no. Bizman Nehem is not really extended one out to the 11th and the 12th. What is it? Zmane Shalzeh, Loi Bizmane Shalzeh. The time of the 14th is not the 15th. The 15th is not the 14th. See, the Talmud tried to marry the two days together and put it onto one unit. No! What Mordechai was saying with the word Bizmane means that the 14th, read it on the 14th. Who reads it on the 14th? And? And? Everybody in the entire world except? Jerusalem, right? Everybody reads it on the 14th. Therefore, Jerusalem comes along and says, no, we read it on the 15th. That's why you need the plural, Bismanihem, to teach us that there are differences between Yerushalayim and the rest of the world. Like The time of, in, you read it in Long Beach on when? This year, it's going to be on? On Tuesday. But in Yerushalayim, they're going to read it on the 15th. That's why you need it, not to tell us the 11th, 12th, 13th. Forget about that. That's just, we, we still we, we don't know. So then he says, no, 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 no. The Gemara goes back and says, like no, 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 no. If you want to say that why did it come to tell us to separate the rules of the 14th and the 15th, im kein lema omer kroz manam. The, 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 the Megillah should have read, the, read it zmanom in their time. In their time, meaning their is plural, but time is singular. In their time to symbolize that the 14th and the 15th are different. The fact that it says bismanehem in their proper times, which is two plural polarities, right? It's their times means no, no, means that there's two sets of two separate times that have to be separated. Have I lost you so far? No? Okay. Let's reiterate this argument one more time. Okay? The word zman means one time, one, that's it. Zman is one time. Zmanam is their time. Meaning we're separating, there's two entities here. It's their time. Meaning that you have their is the 14th and the 15th, but it's their time. Fine. Okay? One time is not like this, and one time is not like that. Now that, if Mordechai's initial intent was only to tell us that the 14th read it on Tuesday, and the 15th read it on Wednesday, no, no, that everybody in the world reads it on the 14th, but Yerushalayim reads it on the 15th, he would have written the word Bismanom in their time. Because that would have told us that there's two entities, and they have separate times, their proper time. The fact that he pluralized, not only there, but also times, he wrote bizman nehem, in their proper times, tells us that now not only do you have the 14th and the 15th as a set that needs to be divided, but there's now a whole different set that needs to be established right now. Why times? So now the plural, the plural of times is now included the 11th and the 12th. Okay? That's not so hard to understand. You got that?
What zman mean? Okay, what does that refer to? One time indivisible by anything. Okay, that's everybody does at the same time around the whole world, like Yom Kippur. Okay, everybody celebrates Yom Kippur bizman at the same time. Why? No one does it the 9th, no one does it the 11th, thank God. Okay, it's all on the 10th. Bismanom means what? Their time. Their time. Bismanom is their time. Telling us that there are two entities here that have a proper time. Not the same, but in their proper time. 14th for the world, 15th for Yerushalayim. Their proper times now tells us that there's a, there's a, there's a separation between their and a separation in times. So now you have ex doubled up. So whatever you have is there. How many days are ex in included in the there? How many? In there? Two, well, how many? 14th and 15th. So the same two now is going to be doubled and going to be made into the 11th and the 12th. So let's learn how the Gemara established this. Okay? This is a study from study land, as they say. Maizmanehem. Why does it mean to say their times? Shamat me no, we learn from this. Kule Eimazmanim Tuva. That all this comes to tell us is there were many, many different times. The 11th, the 12th, the 14th, and the 15th. Now, who's going to ask the Klotz Kasha here? <laughs> who's going to be the Talmudic scholar and ask the question? I keep talking about the 11th, 12th, 14th, and 15th. Okay, where's the 13th? But you know, you go into some elevators, they don't have the 13th floor. Yeah. 13th is a bad number. So maybe they left it out here. Maybe it's an unlucky number. No, because I want you to hold that question in your head. Because right now we've established times and proper, there's there and times as 2-2. Two, two. Just like you have 2 here, you have 2 on this side. We're still missing where the 13th, so hold on. Okay? So he says, So their times is equal to their time. Mazmanim trey, just like their time is two, avzmanihem trey. Also, their times are also two. Okay? So now the Gemara says, the Amo and let us say, okay, so now that we have two and two, Okay, we've established it, right? We all agree that the Anshei Knesset Gdoyla did good, did good work. They, they were investigative. They looked clearly at the, at, at the Megillah, and they learned out from the Megillah. They took, they took a hint, and you know, and they said, you know what, that we have a right, since it says their times, and Mordechai's initial intent was to separate two and two. We did it, okay? So we know we now the 14th and the 15th. We definitely know that the 14th and the 15th. Okay? But let us say, come on, if we're going to do two days, what are the most obvious days to me? Thank you very much, Mr. Tim, for coming up with that. So the good morning, oh, you read it there, um, <laughs> cheater, cheater. You're never supposed to admit, you're never supposed to admit where you got it from, okay? Don't, don't never reveal your sources. Didn't you learn from what's his name? From Nixon, deep throat, never reveal your sources, right? So he says like this, so Amo, so Ema Tracer Vitlesar. So then say it's the twelfth and the thirteenth. Why the eleventh and the twelfth? He says, Kid Omar of Shmuel by Yitzchak. Because of Shmuel by Yitzchak says, Yud Gimel, the thirteenth, Zman Kihil Lakoil, was a day of of uh, of assembly for all. And as he points out over here, interestingly enough. Of the members of the Beth Din, no, not of the members of the Beth Din, this is C number six. Rashi explains, is that C number six? It refers to this, the statement at the scripture on the th 13th, the Jews assembled and defended themselves, right? So the anyways came together. So this was anyways a day that makes sense to read the Megillah. Since the Jews on the 13th came to protect themselves, Hakilu, it says, right, by Yehudim, Nikalu, and like verse number 13, uh, 18 says, but the Jews were assembled on both the 13th and the 14th. So the 13th was anyways already a day of assembly. So the day of assembly, you took it already for granted that they're going to be able to read the Megillah, right? If already they, if, if already they came. 
He says, anyway, says, Asher here ever points out that there's nothing to do with the reading of the Gila, which was instituted to commemorate the resting, and he therefore prefers the explanation of Rabbeinu Tam that on the 13th, the Jews assembled to observe the fast of Esther. Ah, so we see here that there are two different, two differing opinions. One is Rashi who explains why the 13th is an automatic, because on the 13th, scripturally, or from the story of Esther, they anyways gathered together to fight off. So they were anyways already a day of assembly, so that's why it's an automatic. But his, but his grandson, Rabbeinu Tam, says, Grandpa, you're all wet. You don't know really what the true reason is of the 13th, because on the 13th, what do we do on the 13th? We fast. Because why do we fast on the 13th? Does anybody know here why we fast on the 13th? Because Esther begged Mordechai, he says, listen, I'm going to go to Achishverosh. I'm really, I'm, I'm scared. So what I want you to do is I want you to fast for me and pray to God that my mission should be, a, should be successful. Now this is exactly contrary of everything that makes sense. Really, right? Esther's starting to fast. That doesn't, that doesn't make you look too good, right? If, if she wanted to present herself to the king, what she should have done is with makeup and the whole taram and da da da. But she said, no, no, the way I'm going to be successful is if I fast and pray to Hashem, which is a different lesson altogether from what we're learning over here. Okay? What did that have to do with this? Why did I bring this up? Oh, because Rabbeinu Tam says, because the Taisva says that the reason why Yud Gimel is an automatic day of assembly is because of the fast of Esther. Like we will do this Monday. So if you want to have a coffee, you wake up at 5.30 in the morning to have a coffee because I think the fast starts like at 6 o'clock or something like that. And it goes on throughout the entire day till after the reading of the Megillah. Okay? It's a daylight. It's a day-to-day, -day, it's a morning-to-night fast. Thank God it's not like Yom Kippur. You can eat all night long if you want. Now, of course, those are taking medication that have to take medication. You should ask your rabbi if you could still take, you know, I mean, it's all different rules and regulations if you have to eat. I know I don't want anybody to get sick about the fasting, but if you're in good health, if you're strong and you're able to fast, it's a good thing to do that because it's one of the six fasts that we have within, within Judaism. And then after the Megillah, you'll see those people, you'll know exactly who fasted. You know why? Because they will be right at the Hamatash and so fast. As soon as the rabbi, as soon as the reader says the last word here, the Irish time, the Irish time, boom, they're going to hit that Hamatash and stand like there's no tomorrow. All right? So, uh, so you know, so, so just, 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 you know, but if, but if you're not fasting, don't tell anybody. That's why everybody runs to the Hamatash and stand. They don't want to be accused of eating all day. So, you know, but well, we know the truth. Okay? So he says over here, the Omer, 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 Omer of Shmuel by Yitzchak, Yud Gimel's man kehila. It was already the thirteenth. Was already a day of assembly. La koil he for leitzorek labruya. You didn't need an special indication that is required to tell us that this is a day that you could read the Megillah on the thirteenth. Since, anyways, regardless whether Rashi's opinion was why is the thirteenth, why according to Rashi, what was the thirteenth? The Jews. The Jews assembled. Why did they assemble on the 13th? To defend, them. to defend themselves. According to Rabbeinu Tams, why did they get together on the 13th? To, to, fast. to fast. Thank you very much. Hachanami, so here too, Yud Gimel's man kehila la koilhi. Therefore, since the 13th is anyways already a day of, a day of gathering together, whether it's, for the, whether it's for the people of the village or whether it's people of the big city, it doesn't make a difference. V'loi tzarech liribu. You don't need a special indication that that is this. So then he says... We'll go one, one more one more line because because one, once we get into Rab Shmuel Bar Nachmani it gets a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. So then say so then he says the Ema then let us say you know what if you're gonna let if you're gonna establish it to extend it to different times say Shteisar Vishabesar say it's the sixteenth and the seventeenth why do you have to go back to the eleventh and the twelfth say it's the sixteenth and the seventeenth so the Gemara answers Vlo Yavar. Velo Yavor is not to overpass, right? I meant, I think I said that before, back here in verse number, uh, was it 31? I think I said it back here. Oh, here. No. No, 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 this is, this is V'lo Yavur Yehudim. And he says the word V'lo Yavur. So it's in here, to establish it. 
He died, he killed him, and they hung him up. Oh, this is great. And very wonderful. Oh, wow, who she drew? Oh, wow, yeah, presents. Oh, without fail, and at the proper time. Okay, it must be Vlayavar. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'm sorry. And verse number 20, 27. The Jews confirmed and took upon themselves and their prosperity upon all those who might join them to observe these two days. And it says, without fail, in the manner prescribed and at the proper time each year. Okay? So it says, Vlayavar, without fail. So Yavar means to pass over. So we're not going to be able to pass over and then. Say, hey, you know, the 15th passed. Oh, we're reading the Megillah on the 17th. Come on. That doesn't make sense. And it shall not pass. So number seven, he writes over here. The note, what does he say over here? Okay, so now, so that's why you can't have it the 16th and the 17th. So now we understand why we've gone, gone through the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. So let's just sum it up here tonight. This was established by the Anche Knesset Zagdoyle. These rules and regulations were established by the men of the Great Assembly. The men of the Great Assembly had the authority to do this. Why? Because they had a hint within the, within the scripture itself. Now that doesn't mean that every time we're going to have to go through some kind of a special takana, some kind of an, a special regulation, we're always going to ask the same question, where? No. Sometimes they just made a takana. They just made a regulation and they don't ask a question, how do you have ha this? This particular Gomorrah asks a question, whence do they have this authority, so they went back to the Megillah to tell us Bismanehem. Then they went in a whole long discussion about the words in their proper times. In their proper times. Their proper times kind of inferred if you really study hard and you know what you're talking about, to tell us that there were two separate times. The 14th and the 15th were one set, and the 11th and 12th was another set. The Gemara kept asking back and forth questions. How do you know that? Maybe it only meant the 14th and the 15th. Then they would have written Zman. But maybe, maybe no, but it could have been written Zmanam. Now, nah, but the fact that he wrote Zmanayhem in their proper times tells us that there was two days equal. If it was two days equal, why not say the 12th and the 13th? So the answer to that is... No, no, the 12th and the 13th. The Why not? Was day of the 13th was a, anyways a day of an assembly. And we had a difference of opinion. Why was it a day of an assembly? According to Rashi, it was a day of an assembly because of self-defense. And the Jews gathered together in the time of the story. And Rabbi Tam tells us, no, that anyways Jews gathered together because of the fast. fast. Oh, boy, I'm telling you this class here, that I'm telling you much better, much better than when I was in fourth grade and I studied this. I'm telling you, it took us three to seven months to get through this. Okay? What? I'm telling you, you should be very proud of yourself. Okay? I'm telling you. And I'm just joking. It wasn't fourth grade. It was actually in rabbinical school. No, no, okay. But, it's, but you know what? But this is good. This is, this is not so easy because it's very complicated. Now then the Gemara asks again a question. If so, let it go to the, fifth, to the 16th and the 17th. Okay? We agree with you. It's, it, it, there, there's, a, there's two days. So the 16th and the 17th, it can't happen because of the verse, Yavar, which means it shall not pass. And then once it says you shall not pass, once the 15th come and you missed out, you're going to have to wait till next year. Okay? Is that enough contemplation for one night? Okay. 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 So we have to read the Megillah quite twice because it says over here, right? The Queen Esther, daughter of Abichael and Mordechai the Jew, wrote with full authority to ratify the second letter of Purim. So since it says Hashani is the second letter, so we want, to, we want to read it once and twice, right? Two, two times the second letter, okay? And you read it in a scroll. I mean, it's all, all different. I mean, this whole book, look, look, look how thick this book is. From one, from, from one, one little story, we have, we, it starts off, I hope it doesn't start on page. Oh, yeah, it does start page one. Yay, yay, yay. 400, 640 pages of notes just on rules and regulations, okay? About women, the time. Do women have to listen? The answer is yes. They don't have to listen. Why do women have to listen? Here's a good question that we have to ponder. Women are exempt to the reading of the Megillah. Comes. Why do women have to listen to the reading of the Megillah, even though that we know that there's certain mitzvahs that women are exempt? Any time-bound mitzvahs, any mitzvah that's time-bound, they're exempt from. For example, tefillin. 
Tefillin you could only put on during the day, so women are exempt from doing that for a number of different reasons. We're not going to get into it right now. But the Megillah is a time bound, right? Because you could only read it on the 14th. Can you read it on the 17th? No, we know that because of Layavar. Because women took upon themselves at the time of the Megillah itself written. The women said, We're gonna we're gonna read it, so therefore, you know, women are responsible for hearing the reading of the Megillah. There's, but there's, isn't there some leniency on when during the day you read it? Yeah, you could read it. You could read it any time during the day. People read it you know, in the morning, in the afternoon. This, that, but so it's fill is also true. You could put on fill all day. But since, but since you can't put on fill all the time, that means it has a specific time boundary to it, just like the Megillah has a time boundary. But there's a lot of mitzvahs that women took upon themselves within Judaism where they could have had a leniency, like listening to the chauffeur. They, listening to the chauffeur, you can only do it during the day on Rosh Hashanah. You can't do it at night. You can only do it during the day. The fact is that women said, no, no, it's such a beautiful mitzvah, we want to do it. So there's a number of mitzvahs that, okay, with, um, oh, about eating of the Sudas Purim. Go ahead. I have a question. Yes. Uh, about the, the, uh, the parents, you know, every time I'm joking with you and I'm saying, why can't I be in the media? Right. No, but Rashi, what was his justification to let his daughter go? Uh, How do you know that his daughters put tefillin on? That was a sub story in, uh, in the, Rashi's daughter. Oh, you read this book? I'm reading it. Um, I have that. Yeah. Uh, I have, Kenny just gave me the book. How do we know? I no, I, I didn't start reading it because I'm only about two books behind. But I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it soon. Okay, good, good. What? How do we know? How, well, how did his justification? I'll tell you what his justification was. I'll tell you. Okay, because his daughters grew up already in a home that understood that when you wear tefillin, what are the proper kavanis? What are the proper in, thought process goes into wearing the tefillin. They already studied all of the rules and the regulations that needed to go into the proper putting on of tefillin. And plus, they learned already most of the Torah they knew already. You know, they knew, so they were already in a level of up here, where mo most people are not in a level of up here. Most men don't come to the level, but since most men have to put on tefillin, so we say, you know what, okay, put on tefillin, even though, you know, you're not in the proper state of mind, you don't know what's going on, you don't know this, you're responsible, but women, since they're not responsible, and they're not at the level of where Rashi's daughters are, so we say don't. That, that, that was his justification of doing it. Now, if Rashi was around today and his daughters were around today, maybe we had different... Maybe, maybe be a different, maybe be a different story today. But in those days, he allowed them to put on tefillin because of not because they, they were feminists. It wasn't they said, you know what, you're putting on tefillin. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to put on tefillin, but I'm not going to keep kosher. No, this was already after doing all of this stuff. And he said, okay, you want to put on tefillin? Okay, put on tefillin. That 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 would be my understanding of it. Maybe had a different, maybe had a different justification, you know, for doing that. But certainly, that has no relationship to today. Absolutely, because trust me, if a woman within Judaism today, we're going far afield of what we're talking about here, but if a woman today within Judaism wants to get involved, there are so many rules and regulations that she needs to learn before getting to the tefillin part. I mean, think of what women are responsible for, Shabbos. Are you, does anybody know the rules of the Shabbos? Kosher, rules of kosher, all of the rules of the holidays, rules of, rules of children, of education, of prayer, all of the things that women are responsible for. But what's happened now is, now, now we've mixed a cholent because we've already included this thing now, this whole idea of feminism, where now it's not so much what we sh have to know. It's the fact that they, I can't do it. And the moment you say, I can't, oh, I'm going to show you I can. And that's, that's where the problem becomes. That's where the issue becomes. Because we've always said there's so much to learn within Judaism that a woman could be busy day and night for three lifetimes. Hasidus, Kabbalah, all of these things a woman could learn. There's no, no, no problem. Don't even know all this stuff. That's right. That's the problem. That's a different problem that men don't, you know, don't know of this stuff. But the, thing, but the, the, the issue over here became now is it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge towards orthodoxy. That's why if a woman comes to me and says, I, want, I, I, I beg you, I want to put on film, I say, it's not the right thing, but I, I, I have to. But you know what? I say to her, what is your motivation? Why, why are you? Is it, are you motivated because you love the Torah so much? The same Torah that you love so much has told you that you're exempt from doing it. So, so what do you, what so no, 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 because I come to shul and I see Mark puts on tefillin. Oh, I got it. So that to me is not a justification. Just because Mark puts on tefillin, it's not, that's not a justification. If you love the Torah so much, Look at the words of the Torah, and it tells you because you're a woman, you have a special place within Judaism, and this is your this is your role. And and and, and that's what that's the argument. But you know what? The truth of the matter is that 99% of women who put on film today are not because they love orthodoxy. 
It's because they want to challenge orthodoxy. And that is... I would also say, I agree with you, but I would also say if we treat the woman's role with respect, Yes. yes. Then they are not going to challenge that. If yeah. they're shown that they are just as respected as Abs men, mm -hmm. by both oh, men and I, women. I, I, absolutely. So I you are absolutely think, correct. Yeah, I don't you think are, there's going to be any problem when yeah. men have their role yeah. and the woman's role I, I, I is agree with you. I agree with one one hundred percent. The only problem that happens over here is that it's it the roles are misunderstood. See, yes. this, see, that's the problem. In America, we misunderstand the roles of men and women. We think that because a man can get up there and read from the Torah, oh, he has it made. Who wants to do that? I'd rather have the women get up at 6.30 go to the minion. What, what, who, why, why, I need to get up at 6.30 and go to the minion? My, tell my wife, you get up and go to the minion at 6.30. It's misunderstood that this has taken the lead within Judaism. Why is that? I have my own, my own uh, theory why this has happened. But... In America, since we're so pounded into our minds, this whole idea of equality, okay? So you have a woman that's chairman of the board of Euler, of, 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 of Euler Packard, right? Of HP, who makes $29 million a year, okay? She comes, she wants to say Kaddish for her father, okay? She has under her 312,000 employees, whatever Euler Packard has, okay? I don't know. We come to the shul and there's nine men in her, okay? And you're going to tell her, sorry, we can't, we can't make a minion until a homeless guy comes in. Oh, okay, now we can make a minion. We could say Kaddish. To her, this makes absolute... Are you telling me that someone's making $29 million a year, 312,000 employees, I can make the minion, but this homeless guy can make the minion? So in America, we misunderstand what the role is. It's not the importance of the show. It's not the importance. What we've done is we've substituted the real important, the most important um, the institution, which is, what's the most important institution within Judaism? The home, the home. Thank you very much. The family. That's the most important institution. Vaharaya, and the proof in the pudding is, one of the most important things that we do with, in, throughout the entire year, for example, the Seder, is done where? Yeah. At home, right? That's one, one of the most important things is done at the home. Now, what, what happened? So in the days bygone in the Middle Ages, when the home was the center of activity and everything happened in the home, and Shabbos was the home and the family came to the home, who ruled the home? The mother ruled the home. The father came home to make Kiddush. And the shul was a place for basically like a mace, like you no know, guys to hang out. So the women had no problem. But ha what happened here in America? The family fell apart. Okay? The first thing is the family started to fall apart. So if the family fell apart, so where now do you get the social structure? Where is now going to now be the center of activity with, for Judaism? Where is it going to be? The synagogue. the synagogue. And since in most places, the average congregant is not very well versed within Judaism. You see, in the olden days, a woman knew how to run a home. She didn't have to go to the rabbi to tell me if I can, put, if I, if, if I can cook the chicken on Shabbos. The women knew by, by just growing up, they knew all of the rules and regulations. They didn't have to be told. Here in America, I could tell you, I could take the average congregant of any congregation here and bring them here. They'll know nothing. So if you know nothing, where do you have to go to know something? To the synagogue. Yeah. So in the synagogue, now became a hierarchy. So you have the rabbi, and then you have the cantor. Who's that? Blah. You know what? <laughs> the rabbi, and then they made a cantor, schmanter, a cantor. Okay, they Don't forced the religious a, vice president. What? And then they had a vice, religious vice president, and then they had all of this, and then, so now, all of a sudden, where did people get their Judaism from? The synagogue. And then they, then they established this, 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 this thing called a Hebrew school. So instead of sending the kids to Yishi, you think there was a Hebrew school back in the olden days, in the Middle Ages? Who had Hebrew school? You either went to Cheder or you didn't go to Cheder. So those kids who wanted to know something about Yiddishkeit went to school, and those who didn't, didn't go to school at all. There wasn't, okay, you know what, we're going to go to the Polish schools, and then from 3 to 4 on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, we're going to go to the rabbi. Who, oh, that's American. Thank you very much to the American institution of Hebrew schools, which killed more Judaism than, I don't know, than anything else. Because at 4 o'clock, like a guy told me today, who told me today? Some guy told me today it was the worst day. Sundays was the worst day for him. Why? Because all his friends were out there playing ball, baseball, soccer. Where was he? Sitting in a classroom with a rabbi that probably had no inkling or didn't want to be there. The kids didn't want to be there. So this is a recipe for... Disaster. Yeah. We have two rabbis playing softball on Sunday. Yeah, we have two, two, two Orthodox rabbis. There you go. There you go. So 
It's all going to hell in it's, the hand. It's all going to hell in the hand. They're so very good. Rabbis. They're there very you go. Good. There you go. By the way, if anybody wants to play We're Sunday. After the Minion. Yeah. <laughs> After the Minion. But so, so, so therefore, this, this, is, this, this, is basically, this is basically what you had. So you have a breakdown now of family. You have now the rise of, 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 of feminism. So you have now, now, now you now it to, now it obviously doesn't make any sense anymore. If the shul is truly now in America has taken over as the pivotal, as the main part of Judaism, and there's no family to go home to on a Friday night to make to make Shabbos to, and America tells you that a, a woman is equal to a man, that would make sense. Now, 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 to me, the argument is that if a woman belongs to a progressive congregation. I won't call it conservative or reform, but a progressive congregation. It makes 100% sense that she should want to have a bat mitzvah and she should want to read from the Torah because that's what America is all about. The women who still belong to orthodoxy, to an orthodox congregation, still, I, I, I believe, understand, like my wife will argue this, which I argue with her because I say the rules, you know, in, in progressive shuls, there's nothing wrong with giving women aliyahs. They have to because this is, this is all part of their philosophy. My wife says, no, no woman, okay, I, I wish i talk for her, she's not here to defend herself, but many Orthodox women will say, nah, who cares? Who wants an aliyah? You think that turns us on, coming up and reading from the Torah? It doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. For me, what does it is a family, you know, in more, I guess, more traditional, what we call more traditional values. But... That, well, I don't know how we got into this discussion. Just because we're talking, just when we're talking about Esther. Yep. I mean, you see, <laughs> Esther got us into this big trouble. Well, she commanded the holiday, right? How many women in our history? How many books in the Torah are named after a woman? How many? One. There you go. Ruth and Ruth and Esther, two. And Ruth was the same way, right? Ruth wouldn't take no for an answer, right? She was the first, well, she wasn't the first convert, but she was what the, a convert really is all about. She, you know, went and she fought, you know, those famous words, your God is my God, and when you go, I will go, and I'm not leaving, and you know, all of that stuff. And that's why you have to be very strong to get a, to get a book named after you. Look, I don't have a book named after me. I've tried a number of different times. A lot of 